I'll give a brief introduction to our two wonderful presenters who really need no introduction, but you might learn some new things about them. Um, and so, like Dina said, we're so thrilled to have Dr. Kathy Yeager and Dr. Lorianne Shaw with us today, giving their presentation, Does Teamwork Really Make the Dream Work? So um, a little bit about Kathy. Um, Kathy began her journey with ACU's EDD in Organizational Leadership Program in 2018. So her field is human resource development, but her passion is helping students earn their degrees and achieve their career goals and change organizations, one student at a time. Kathy's an active member of the Academy of Human Resource Development and loves volunteering at food pantries. Kathy spent almost 20 years in the telecommunications industry learning firsthand about organizational change before pursuing her PhD, which brought about personal transformational change. She's a dissertation chair as well as the EDD program's interim program director. So something you may not know about Kathy, some of her early career development at age 16, um, I'm trying to keep this straight face, included driving a forklift to load crates of cucumbers on a flatbed trailer. So um, if you need any tips on cucumbers or flatbed trailers or forklifts, Kathy is your go-to person. Um, and Dr. Lori Ann Shaw, as you will know, um, supports the learning design and operations divisions of ACU Dallas, which integrates the operational work of course design, development, and delivery. The division is comprised of three departments, the Demkin Center Solutions Department, Registration and Operations, and um, Faculty Operations. Lori Ann began working at ACU in 2007 as the Masters of Arts in Conflict Management and Resolution program launched online. She served as a course developer, practice coordinator, and as a course facilitator in negotiation and mediation, managing conflict in schools, managing conflict in the workplace, communication and conflict theory, and advanced mediation courses. Lori Ann has also served as co-trainer for the program's conflict resolution residency session and the 40-hour basic mediation training. Lori Ann served three years as a board member for the Texas Association of Mediators, five years as an officer for the Texas Mediation Trainers Roundtable, and is currently serving as chair of the board of Come Before Winter, a nonprofit that provides renewals for women in ministry around the world. Something you may not know about Lorianne, she has one sister 13 months younger and another sister 13 years. Wait, I'm sorry, one sister 13 months younger and another sister 13 years older. Um, is that right? Or did I mistype it, Lorianne? They're both younger. They're one's both younger. Younger, one's way younger. One's younger, one's way, way younger. Okay. Um, okay. So even I'm surprised by that. Um, but that's so cool. And um, and she talks to both of them every day on Marco Polo. And so without further ado, take it away, ladies. Thank you, KK. Uh, when you when you approached me about doing this. Um, I said teams. Yes, I love I love teams and and the research around those and and everything. And I said, but you know, doing it as a single person that's kind of sad. So I had read uh, Lori Ann's dissertation, and I so I reached out to her and thought that we our messages could um, dovetail nicely together, and we could put something together really special. And I hope that that you find it that. Um, it may not be new information to you, but hopefully the way that we've packaged it will make you think about different thing, things differently and improve uh, performance of whatever team that you're on. Um, so this is going to be very interactive because I'm not a sage on stage. Even when I was was uh, instructing in real life uh, IRL, right? It's like um, I, I want audience participation. So use the chat. 
And for this first question, these first questions, though, I want to, if you have a compelling story that you'd like to share, go ahead and come off mic. I think we've got it for a couple um, of minutes to um, talk about this. But so who likes teamwork? Who likes teamwork? Yeah. Uh, so what's one of the best experiences that you've had as a team or one of the worst experiences that you've had a team on a team that you'd like to share either you know come off mic or drop it in the chat working in the edd of org leadership program is one of the best experiences i've ever had I'm going to say that working on experience, working on a team where the leader was very type A and wanted to manage and control and do everything her way rather than allowing everyone else's personalities and experiences come in to play. Uh, for me, I... I enjoy working on a team where the leader allowed everyone to use their strengths. So you were able to get different perspectives. I previously worked in hospice care and everything we did was part of a multidisciplinary team. And I absolutely loved the holistic approach to the patient, whether that's their spiritual needs, their physical um, basic needs, just all of the parts of it coming together. Um, was a really beautiful experience to be a part of. I think some of the components that I like about teamwork is is the synergy and relationship and diverse voices. All positive things. That's wonderful. So exciting. Um, well, as we go through the the presentations and everything, I I don't mean to trigger anybody or make you think about the bad things. But, um, you know, those that's all part of it because um, teaming can be difficult, right? And a group of people working together on individual projects that get folded into a larger project don't necessarily create a team. A team works toward a shared vision and a common goal. And team members have to navigate those interpersonal relationships that come with. So... Does teamwork really make the dream work when there are difficult challenges to overcome? Well, as any good scholar or accountant will tell you, it depends, right? So teaming can be difficult, like I said. Um, let's look at one of the, I guess, the premier um, team scholars um, models, and it's been around for, for a really long time, but I think it's good to refresh our thoughts on this just to see how teams come together and those that, you know, you described strong working teams. So you were down further in the list of, of the, the performing state, but you all started in that forming. You know, you've got individuals that are coming together, that are getting to know one another, that are in that honeymoon phase, if you will, that are trying to figure out direction, right? And that forming moves into storming within um, that working relationship. It's when you're talking about, okay, so why are we here? How are we managing competition as you work through setting direction? Um, yes, uh, someone talked about, you know, that type A personality driving a team. Well, that's just someone telling members what to do and it's not a really collaborative thing that's going on so is the the leader if you will allowing for the strong formation of the team that so many of you experienced um then you get into norming which is sharing of ideas and giving and receiving feedback to achieve this special this specific goal that you've established as part of that that uh, teaming process and then you get into performing where you've got a strong trusting foundation there's cohesion there's everything's clicking if you will and um, everyone knows how everybody else is going to respond that kind of thing so 
it's a great um it just feels good right it's 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 a great experience and then there's the adjourning piece that that has been thrown on um sometimes teams are permanent um uh, sometimes teams are temporary but regardless of of whether that um uh, the nature of the team that adjourning piece means that that you can stop and talk about lessons learned somewhere along the way. Think about how improvements can be made within that process of, of, of teaming so that um, things can get better. And, you know, once you complete the list, there's still opportunity to go back up the list because what happens when you get new members that come into the team? You basically have to start over with the forming because you're bringing them in. You've got to learn them. You've got to to incorporate them into the process, those kinds of things. So so there's always opportunity for things to go off the rails. Right. So so the challenges that teams encounter, you know, it's like goals change. Or, you know, trust can be lost in a heartbeat. Um, and then those team member transitions. So how are teams adjusting to make those, um, to still perform, right? And how are they, they going to be able to continue to more working toward those goals? So one of the things, one of the components in this is diversity, right? Um, what kind of diversity do you encounter in teams? And go ahead and drop into the, the chat. What kind of diversity do you see when you're operating in teams? And KK, if you could just kind of give us a rundown whenever everybody's kind of entered. Oh, there we go. So, KK, what's streaming in on that? Oh, I'm so sorry. I was muted. Um, <laughs> we have cultural diversity and diversity of personalities and how people approach tasks. And then, um, and then besides the the visual diversity, there's the invisible communication style, expectations, different definitions of norms. Boy, that was a loaded that was a that was a loaded question, but I had to ask a bunch of academics, right? Um, yes, yeah, so you've got the things that you can see, the differences that you can see, and the differences that you can't see. And so acknowledging and being able to work through those differences is going to be important in uh, creating this high-performing team and, and achieving your goal. So research suggests that diverse teams are stronger, uh, can, can have stronger performance outcomes when shared mental models are present. But sharing mental models doesn't mean groupthink, right? So groupthink can have disastrous effects so think about NASA's space shuttle, the Challenger and the Columbia. Um, those have both, through research, been, been connected back to the, the problems with groupthink. Um, so with, within, so, so um, how do you overcome groupthink? And uh, Amy Edmondson's work, I, I like to rely on uh, regarding psychological safety. Uh, tells us that in teams where psychological safety exists, that team members can take risks, they can express ideas and concerns, they can speak up with questions, and they can admit mistakes without fear of negative consequences. Now, this doesn't mean that the team members don't hold each other accountable but that it is one where there's that, that safety there that you can feel assured that I can bring this up and we're gonna be able to work through based on learning um, 
and those kinds of things to move forward with our mission in that. Um, so one of my one of my go to that I'm trying to get through, right? The, the go to reads that I'm trying to get through at this point, but I'm, I'm just in love with is Amy Edmondson's right kind of wrong, the science of failing well. And she, she, she identifies three types of failure that, that teams um, can encounter or individuals can encounter. Um, one uh, is intelligent failure. And intelligent failure being that high uncertainty of event with a low preventive ability and, you know, from that, are you learning from the failure to move forward? And then there's also complex failure, which is one of those, you're, you've got that neutral, perfect storm where you've got everything piling on and things are just happening um, beyond your control in that. And she says that they're usually warning signs but that those warning signs are either overlooked or avoided, or you get find yourself in that group think, um, but they're often often ignored. And so it's just it's a complex failure of systems. And then you've got your basic failures, which are low uncertainty and preventable things. That's like mistakes. That's those oopsie type things. Like like you know, for me, it was putting chili powder and sweet potatoes at Thanksgiving one. One Thanksgiving and you know and it's like it's like um it was just my bad you know type thing and but the family just won't let me live it down right um so psychological psychological safety I'm not sure um but this is this is from um the book and while and you can see psychological safety high psychological safety low and low standards or high standards and um, when the psychological safety is low and there are low standards of performance, you know, you're going to have people checking out, right? Um, if you've got high psychological safety and low standards, and eh, everybody's just kind of cruising, cruising right along, right along, you know, it's um, just that status quo. If you've got low psychological safety and high standards, um, and people are afraid of making mistakes and afraid of voicing what's going on then you risk covering up and not being able to work through the problems that are there. So the failing well is where you get into high standards and high psychological safety, where you're in it for, for, um, for finding what's not working so that you can move the project forward. And we see this in, in her examples in her book talking about the, the, the research aspects of things. You know, this is how we're, we're going to um, to overcome because, you know, science yeah, and my, my students, it's like, I want to prove. It's like, well, you're not going to prove. And they find disappointment in not not finding the results that they're looking for. But that's that's what we do. It's systematic inquiry. And so we don't expect to achieve every time. But but this is a new concept for a lot of people. Um, so does teamwork really make the dream work? Well, it depends. How well does the team handle conflict that might be present? Thanks, uh, Dr. Yeager. So um, conflict is inevitable in teams. And I find that it's helpful for me to just repeat that to myself every now and then. Um, because our culture seems to have this expectation that at work, we won't experience conflict if we're in a good workplace environment. And um, I'd like to contrast that idea with other areas of our lives where we seem to expect some level of conflict. Uh, take marriage, for example. So many of you, uh, when you became engaged um, to your partner, uh, if you're married, you, you likely receive the advice that you should go to premarital counseling. Like this is the person you love more than anyone else on the planet. This is the person you're choosing. Um, but still like we expect to have conflict with our, with our partner. 
And we, uh, culture even tells us to take these proactive steps to make sure that we learn how to do conflict well. So in marriage, we, we seem to recognize that we have this interdependence and our experience tells us that interdependence is a breeding ground for conflict. And so we work to equip ourselves and protect those marriage relationships. Uh, I think uh, we would do well um, if our culture would take that same approach, that same expectation to our workplace teams. Like what if we acknowledge the interdependence we have with particular colleagues? And what if we assumed that conflict was inevitable? Would those expectations change our approach? All of this to say, I think it's helpful if we expect some level of conflict is going to happen at work, especially um, with those that we work most closely with. Then our goal, you know, won't be to avoid conflict, but rather to maximize its usefulness and to navigate it wisely. So uh, one way to think of conflict is as a double-edged sword. Um, it can either enhance or hinder performance. Uh, over the last 30 to 40 years, organizational psychology uh, research has focused on understanding the conditions under which conflict could maybe be beneficial. And in that pursuit, researchers have found it necessary to distinguish between um, the types of conflict. So here you can see relationship conflict arises from personal incompatibilities. These are like personality clashes, annoyances, and this type of conflict consistently harms team performance. Past conflict, on the other hand, involves disagreements about ideas or decisions. Um, I hope my light bulb there helps uh, 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 you imagine this idea. But conflict, uh, task conflict is left personal. The conflict lives outside of the human being. Uh, it is their idea, not who they are. And this type of conflict has the potential to cause harm, but it also has the potential to improve team performance by fostering creativity and better decision-making. And uh, uh, it may be no surprise to you that psychological safety is the key moderator here. So research indicates that psychological safety can actually turn task conflict into a positive force for teams. High psychological safety encourages open, non-threatening discussions. And research has shown that psychological safety can actually help prevent task conflict from turning into relationship conflict, which helps preserve that team harmony and enhance performance. Next slide. So uh, Dr. Yeager kindly invited me to, to join this presentation today right after completing my dissertation. Um, still, the ink is barely dry. Um, my research guided by some folks you know very well, maybe some even on this call. I think I saw Dr. Lumpy come in. Um, Dr. Jackie Hall that was my chair, Dr. Andrew, Andrew Lumpy and Dr. Stephanie Hamm were on my committee. My research focused on shame, guilt, and behavioral responses to conflict in organizational life. Uh, June Tangy's seminal work distinguishes shame and guilt as separate emotions. Shame, a negative view of our overall self. I am a bad person. Shame is personal. It is about who we are. Uh, guilt, on the other hand, is in a negative view of a specific behavior. I did a bad thing. I made a bad choice. Um, the wrong here lives outside of the human being. It is their behavior or their choice that's called into question, not who they are. Next slide. So Bayrant and Benari's 2012 study uh, looked at how shame and guilt relate to conflict style. And you can see here that guilt was connected to a cooperative style, while shame was connected to a competitive style. Next slide. This same study found guilt to be connected to a high concern for the other person and a high sense of taking personal responsibility for one's behavior, while shame was connected to uh, a high concern for oneself and a moderate sense of feeling exposed or vulnerable, which can tend to make us want to withdraw or avoid. Uh, there was a study in 2018 that actually found that behavior-focused conflict models like 
the conflict dynamics profile um, better predict common conflict behaviors than conflict style models. So my research sought to advance Bayrant and Benari's study by looking at the connection between shame, guilt, and conflict behaviors. Next slide. Um, so I found that shame was positively correlated to destructive conflict behaviors that escalate conflict, while guilt was positively correlated with constructive behaviors that de-escalate or soothe conflict. Um, this is in, in line with um, Bayrent and Benari's um, study. I pulled these numbers right out of my correlation tables for you, but you can see that shame was significantly correlated with seven of the eight destructive responses on the conflict dynamics profile, while guilt was significantly correlated with six of the seven constructive responses. So this research uh, suggests that specific emotions are connected with specific behaviors that either escalate or de-escalate conflict. So, so my takeaway here is that it seems important that we're able to identify the particular emotions we feel when we're triggered before we take some kind of action. Next slide. So this is the Pathways of Conflict model by Runde and Flanagan connected to the conflict dynamics profile um, from Eckerd College's Center for Creative Leadership. If you don't follow them on LinkedIn, I recommend that you do. I, I really enjoy um, uh, their work. I've added these gray boxes here, so they won't claim them as their model, but um, this is me trying to understand uh, my own research and, and how it could be helpful. So I like the pathways model because it shows the progression of the conflict and that it doesn't just arise from thin air. So this model recognizes that conflict begins with a trigger, an event that irritates us or threatens us in some way. And this trigger often leads to a physiological response. And these responses can manifest in various physical ways and are natural human reactions meant to protect us, right? Like being triggered, neither good nor bad. It is just simply part of the human experience. Um, what is crucial is that we have the ability to recognize when it's happening. If you are unsure of your telltale sign of being triggered, consider asking someone close to you if they know when you're triggered. And then ask them how they know. Um, I asked my husband this question several years ago and I thought, oh, he's gonna have to think about it for a minute. Nope, nope, he immediately responded, oh, oh, yeah. I know I've annoyed you when you cross your legs and kick your foot up and down. And I was like, I do that? I had no idea. Um, so interestingly, him telling me that helped me realize um, uh, when I'm triggered. So I'll, I will be sitting in a meeting, for example, now, and I'll notice I've crossed my legs and my foot's kicking, and then I will scan like, Am I annoyed? Did something just happen? What am I feeling? And so um, it's been very helpful. Um, recognizing when we are triggered is essential as it serves as an alarm. In this case, it's an alarm um, that we might need to take a, a second and consider what emotions are coming up for us. And if we recognize that we're feeling shame, this can serve as a red flag warning, warning um, indicating that we might be at a higher risk for engaging in some sort of destructive behavior that could escalate the conflict. So just a few um, takeaways for navigating conflict in teams. We should expect some conflict, it's normal. We want to work to create psychologically safe environments where task conflict can be used constructively. We want to be able to recognize when we're triggered and know what it feels like in our bodies. Um, and these think we want to think of, of being triggered and noticing those triggers as helpful alarms. We also want to be able to figure out our emotions. Um, specifically, we want to be able to, to scan for shame um, since we know it's it, it, it could mean that we that we might escalate the conflict. And lastly, we want to focus on ideas and choices and behaviors and be sure not to target individuals. Uh, I will 
throw it back to you, Kathy. So there's one other um, model that I wanted to share with you. I saw this a long time ago, but even in today's world, um, that uh, we're they're still relevant. Where we're still we're still working in teams, whether it's virtual, whether it's face to face, um, and in in true fashion, we're going to start at the bottom of the list because if if you look this up, it's it's actually a pyramid, and trust within that teaming relationship is going to be the foundation of everything that is built on uh, everything that, that the team is, is working to um, achieve. It's that trust. In the absence of trust, everything falls apart. Um, and that tr when trust is pre present, then the fear of conflict is mitigated. That's when you can um, overcome, overcome bad conflict, find that healthy conflict that Lorianne was talking about, so that you can move beyond the veiled comments and this general destruction, I mean, general discussion to get to the point where you're working to solve whatever problem it is that your team has been presented with or work through to achieve whatever goal it is that you're you're presented with. Um, so if you can't get past the conflict because you haven't built the trust, then you're not going to have commitment from the team members to overcome, um, be overcome with whatever exchange of ideas, open debate, those kind of kinds of things that are really essential to uh, having team performance. And if you can't get past, if, if you're not getting people to commit to your team, then you're not going to have accountability so that, you know, there's not going to be a buy-in there's not going to be um, anything that's going to to help you achieve the goal. Actions may be counterproductive to the behaviors that you need to grow the team and accomplish what it is that you want to to achieve. And then, of course, last, you know, when the pyramid is collapsing, you've got inattention inattention to results. Uh, failure to hold each other accountable means that individuals need, um, individual needs take precedent over the team. So, Lorianne, uh, KK, do you have our discussion questions? Okay, so can, um, you know what? I'm so sorry. I have those on a different, a different sheet. Let me find it. I think I have them. I can put them in the chat if you want. Okay. Me. Thank you. I apologize. Thank you for creating an environment of psychological safety that. <laughs> it's all good. Okay, so um, we thought it might be nice to drop into um, smaller groups. And so uh, Kathy's working on that, um, some groups where you guys can pick one of these questions that resonates with you. You might copy and paste them and take them um, to your group or throw them in a, in a document for yourself or, or just look right now and go, oh yeah, I'd like to talk about that, whichever. Um, and and then uh, we'll come back here and we'd love to hear from you guys. We'd love um, if it's appropriate for you to share what you heard from someone else um, and maybe what you learned from it, from them sharing. So um, Kathy, I will let you let us know when you're ready to send folks off into those groups. I think we'll we'll stay in the groups for how long, Kathy? Um, about five minutes, I think, is a good time. Then we'll come back and debrief on that. And let's see how many, KK, how many do we have in the, the thing? 17. 17. So, um, three, five. So, three groups is probably good. So, um, uh, we'll see you back in about five minutes.
Thank you guys for coming back. I was I was joking um, that <laughs> like a good uh, discussion question to scare people off at the end of the presentation. So thank you guys so much. Um, we'd love to hear um, somebody can summarize for the group or um, or anyone can pop off a mute and uh, tell us something you heard that that you found insightful from someone else in your group. And um, yeah. Either way. Something insightful from our group, I think, is that um, it was brought up that it can be really difficult to read other people across Zoom mm. and to know when somebody is, is struggling or frustrated and mm. that can be a yeah. challenge. Like you couldn't even see my foot tapping, like in Zoom, <laughs> right? Like totally out of, out of camera. <laughs> that's a great. That's a great point. Um, how how are remote teams impacted, right? Um, oh, that's a really good observation. I think it piggybacks on something our group is talking about too. And by the way, Christine shared a really good model. Um, I can drop. I don't know if everybody can see it in the chat, but. Uh, um, a team performance model. But anyway, we talked about the same thing about it's harder to build, but it's harder to build team relationship in an online environment like at ACU Dallas. So it's critical that people just spend time hanging out with each other apart from these 30 or 60 minute meetings where you're very task oriented and you can't build relationships. So being purposeful, I think about building relationships is so critical. Absolutely. Well, now I'm dying to see Christine's model. So, it's not my model, but it's it was a good one for me to understand team dynamics. <laughs> okay, well, I'd love to huddle up huddle up later. Thanks, thanks, Andrew. What else? KK shared a story where she experienced um, some shaming uh, from mm -hmm. a leader. And um, where the other tenured um, professors um, kind of called that out. And I, I thought that was a great display of, of almost just team empathy and, and relationship. Absolutely. Is that right, KK? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that was the, um, I mean, the, the leader didn't care for me um anyway and it was it was obvious that um i felt so elevated by by the team um when they had my back and it kind of made me realize wow i think a really strong team can make up for for leadership mm -hmm. um there's this concept of uh, cohesion in a team versus psychological safety right like that wasn't a psychologically safe environment but it sounds like you did have cohesion with your team. And so even though that environment wasn't safe, the relationships um, within your team were, that's really powerful. A great example. What else? Well, we talked about fear of conflict usually resulting from a disconnect. Um, someone understands something different than the other person in the room and their mind is already made up in the first place. And so they're not really listening to, to hear what the other person has to say. So the first thing that we have to do is always just be open to talking to each other, to grow in discomfort, to embrace discomfort. Um, and I, it was, it was actually a very funny dynamic in our room because we had someone who specialized in counseling and therapy. And then we had someone also that handles these decisions all the time in HR that kinds of, that, that level down these different type of issues. And so one of the uh, funny quotes that came out of it was our issues and our tissues, making sure that we uh, look into those issues and embrace each other and address the elephants in the room. And from an HR perspective, whenever you have that disconnect or that fear arise, you wanna handle the conflict right on. You wanna be direct about it. You don't wanna be one of those leaders that looks the other way when things like that are happening in your, in your environment. Oh, thank you, Jackie. 
yeah that was a great that was a great group i got to observe that one as well i was talking to a friend earlier the week and and we're talking about bumpy roads in teens right well bumpy roads can be from all of the stuff that you dust under the rug right <laughs> all the bumps that you're trying to go over after everything's trying to ignore right Anybody else have anything? Just a uh, few tips, just kind of a few takeaways on um, tips for practice as you move forward from this um, day with your to the rest of your work. Um, know your response to feedback received in teams, you know, the whole shame versus guilt. What are you feeling? Um, know yourself type thing. Um, give feedback, focusing on the behavior, not the shame, um, and looking for those triggers. Um, create that space for intelligent failure, learning. You know, how are you learning from what has occurred uh, to move forward? Uh, build relationships to build trust and then look for opportunities to instill psychological safety within your workspaces to make those those uh, make it a safe environment to to challenge in that Lorianne, what else would you add nothing thank you for um thank you for the opportunity to be with you guys Good to see your faces and fun to get to talk about this with you. Thank you, KK. Thank you, Dr. Yeager. Thank you all. And we have a few minutes for questions. If anybody would like to unmute and ask any questions of our wonderful presenters. I have a question. Can you go into um, a little bit more about what intelligent failure means? What that what that entails, what that is. Yeah, um, the intelligent failure would be, think of it as along a continuum where you've got some, you've got failure. I started to do the, to, to do the diagram, but it's um, failure, intelligent failure is going to be something that, um, think about a research setting where you go through iterative processes of making um, making discoveries and the intelligent failure is okay we're going to try this it may not it may not work but but when we fail when we we fail we're we're conscious of that process and helping to uh, uncover um, not not stopping, not stopping because of the failure, not um, not throwing things out because of the failure, but taking it as a learning opportunity to move forward. Does that make sense? Maybe? Yeah. Um, there's a what's that diagram. Uh, So intelligent failure is going to be where it's it's in uncertain term in uncertain environments versus predictable environments where the the basic failures would occur. So so it's like um, the basic failures would be something like um, you know putting putting um, uh, putting well my example putting chili powder in my sweet potatoes. Just, just, just a basic failure. I wasn't paying attention, but the intelligent failure is going to be something that, that you were methodically going through the steps and processes, but it didn't work out. So it's like, a, okay, what are we going to learn from this to move forward in that? Great question. Like Kathy, if you'd been trying to make spicy potatoes and you were testing out that recipe, like, would that be an intelligent failure? And maybe you learned 
it's not a hit with my Thanksgiving crowd or something. That <laughs> perspective is everything, isn't it? She learned not to keep the chili by the cinnamon. <laughs> I was at my I was at my dad's. So, so at my house, at my house, that's where the cinnamon would have been, but at my dad's house, it was not. <laughs> I saw Dina say yum, so she must, so she might want your recipe with the chili powder. <laughs> oh, there it is. Okay. Let's see if I can put this up there. Where is it? There we go. Um, talking about um, preventable, yeah, uncertain uncertainty here and intelligent failure um predictable and basic so yeah preventability so those intelligent failures aren't going to necessarily be preventable and um they're going to be at the higher end down here whereas the basic failures are preventable those kinds of things that perfect storm i was talking about that kind of resides there in the middle um like um the examples in the books, like the um, the Valdez oil spill, kind of a perfect storm type of thing going on. Um, Boeing, the Boeing fiascos, with the that that's the the that's that's that complex failure in there. Thank you. That's, mm -hmm. Thank you all so much for coming today. And thank you so much, Kathy and Lorianne, for your wonderful presentation. It was fun. Good to see you guys. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.